Hi, uh, are you ready for the lunch? <laughs> so let's be quick and uh, we get to lunch qu first. Um, I'm going to play a video uh, showing a small use case, which is just my pure hobby and interest. There's no business related to it. And then we talk about uh, MicroPython and uh, how to actually use it in real-time environment which means you have an embedded system, a small electronic device that's run, that runs very low-level code, uh, very simple, very low resources, not enough memory, not enough flash memory for the program, and uh, you have some real-time deadlines, and you want to meet them, and at the same time you want to enjoy the comfort of uh, programming in Python. Let's go. Cinemas. Uh, okay, uh, you notice there are some boats, many of them. Uh, you can think of them as formal ones. Uh, there's not many places for mistakes, but it's still only a hobby and we do it for fun. So no people usually get injured, even though it's a little bit dangerous occasionally. And uh, the hobby was somehow stuck for the past 10 years and people were working on the mechanical part because that's where all these hobbies used to uh, they, they usually come from machining circles, so they know how to produce something on a lay, lathe or on a milling machine, but they don't know much about electronics. And I decided, let's uh, move this a bit further. There should be a lot of things that you can automate, that you can measure, that you can control. And I was thinking, well, uh, I could do it in C, because my background is uh, embedded systems. Uh, we set a company about six years ago doing projects for industry automation. And what turns out, uh, that the industry is actually facing exactly the same problem. They are building applications in C. They cannot usually afford C++ on those uh, types of systems because the resources are limited. Uh, and their code base is growing. And the problem is, that one part of the code base is always the same. It's the low-level part, the drivers, the abstractions of the hardware. But the business logic changes. And this is where all the mistakes usually occur. And I'm happy uh, you were here at the first talk, because it's somehow related. We don't have too much place for, for mistakes in those applications. Um, it's always nice to talk about it. Uh, but the actual implementation is what counts. So if I was to present this to our customer, even though we are not in this business anymore, we like Bitcoins already, um, the marketing slides, they always are good, but the real application is something that uh, could convince the customer to use it. Um, and the system that I try demonstrating, basically what I did is uh, I used uh, a real-time kernel, this time as a free RTOS, and I put MicroPython on top of it as one of its tasks. Uh, this picture actually demonstrates what the boat setup somehow looks like. It's got an engine and propeller and rudder, nothing special. Uh, this is a special part, it's an exhaust pipe but uh, it's actually a supercharger because it's a two-cycle engine. So all the magic in the power of the boat is here. And this is where the real-time part comes in. Very critical. 
The reason why I try doing it with, uh, with Python in this combination is that it allows me to quickly prototype and change different things while keeping the core, which maintains this, uh, very stable. OK. Uh, first, I would like to describe the uh, control system, just the basics, what, what is going on. So uh, there's the engine. Uh, we're measuring the RPMs. It's the ECU where we are running all our stuff. Uh, based on the RPMs, the ECU is actually giving some commands to a server, servo that's uh, adjusting pipe length. And this is where the top power is being generated. So this is where you need to be uh, on time. The engine reacts very quickly. It's very surprising, even though all, the, all other processes in this physical system are very slow, like temperatures. But, but this part, you, you move the pipe, and the engine reacts in like 50 milliseconds, which is for a desktop scheduler. If you have your Linux, it's like 100 milliseconds. It's nothing. Uh, as, as, that's the usual turnaround in our, in our desktop application. So, and it's also a surprising thing for me as well. Um, at the same time, we are measuring uh, gas temperatures in the exhaust. It's uh, just a feedback for the ECU so that it can adjust the mixture. And we're monitoring the plug. Plug is uh, not a spark plug, but it's like a, it has a filament in it, and it heats up every cycle and starts the burning cycle. Uh, the ECU is dumping some data to an SD card, so you have a very detailed log. And at the same time, it's maintaining an RF link uh, with the pilot, which is me. So I can change some, some small settings, but there's not too much time in the race. So, uh, and obviously, I get some GPS data coordinates and speeds. Um, this is me as the driver. Um, maybe you noticed on the pontoon, there were never only single driver, but the driver always had a person standing next to him, and he was actually navigating him. So this part, uh, it's a cell phone connected through Bluetooth uh, to the transmitter. So I'm giving the commands to the boat to steer and throttle. But the, the guy, it's called Pitman for us, is actually watching the telemetry data of the engine like in Formula One. And he's telling me something's going wrong. That's it. Nice toy. Uh, the layout of the whole system is not very surprising. But I just wanted to point out uh, that we're in a real-time operating system. Basically, it's nothing special. It's just a, a task scheduler. Uh, those systems have no memory management unit. At the best case, they have a, a memory protection unit. But, but that's it. So, so the RTOS is pretty much a scheduler of various tasks, where for this particular case, we have two real-time tasks. One is uh, uh, responsible for the engine co control, moving the pipe online based on the RPM. So those, those two tasks cooperate. Uh, I need a separate task to, to measure the RPMs. Uh, then we have the communication task with the radio, even though it's not that much uh, time critical, but for synchronization purposes, because the, the transmitter is streaming data continuously, you don't want to miss frames. You can throw them away, but you don't want to miss them, because then you have problem with synchronization. And then you have some slow uh, processes or tasks. One is uh, measuring different sensors that are slow in nature, like uh, the data from the GPS you get every, every one second, I think. And the temperature also is not changing that quickly. So you don't need a high priority task for that. And finally, you have MicroPython. That actually deals with me, because he is uh, providing the data that the Pitman sees. Uh, and he's storing the data uh, on the SD card and uh, configuring this part based on something that has been stored on, on the SD card. Uh, let's look at uh, a piece of code, which is Python. Uh, can you read it a bit? OK. Uh, this is nothing special for people who write code. Uh, basically, it's reading configuration of the pipe, because it needs to do some interpolation. But I point out two specific places. Uh, string expansion, very easy to do in Python. But think of a poor uh, C programmer that is supposed to write a software 
uh, in C environment, not being allowed to use all the C library calls like malloc, scanf, and so on. And if he uses them, he's never sure what it actually does. It's a big problem, uh, even though there are clones of C library for embedded systems. It's called newlib. But still, you don't want to trust it, and you don't want to use it in real-time systems where you have deadlines. So those parts are painful for the C programmer because he never knows what it really does under the hood. It's calling malloc, freeing buffers, fragmenting some, some heaps, heap memory, and that's not good. So if you carry out this piece of code in, in, in Python, uh, it's very easy. Similarly, uh, when you're reading some configuration, uh, you probably want to parse some numbers. Again, Python just does the job for us and does it very quickly and properly. Uh, doing a tokenizer in C, you probably have some C calls in, in the C library, but again, you never know what they're really doing and if they do it right. There are many bugs. And usually, those format strings, sorry, oops. Those format strings are the sources of many buffer overflows in the nature. So it's good uh, we can do it here. And actually, when you uh, write the drivers, you never get to uh, use any of that, pretty much. So that's the cool part. Um, one part. Uh, is still missing, uh, and that's the async programming. Uh, you know, in Python 3, which is the version that is implemented in MicroPython or MicroPython, um, there's a support for all the async primitives, but your responsibility is either to use async I.O. implementation or provide your own even loop driver. And Having this in, uh, integrated in a real-time environment is a bit of a challenge. So I didn't spend much time on that. But it would be really cool because you can uh, sort of micro-schedule within the entire MicroPython task. And what that yields, it gives you a very nicely organized code. And at the same time, you don't have to care about the deadlines. Maybe you're asking, so why don't you take the whole MicroPython uh, as is and put it on this board? Technically, it's feasible. Throw away the RTOS and just do all this stuff entirely in Python and use uh, async in, in uh, MicroPython as is. Uh, the problem is that you never know uh, the deadlines because in MicroPython, you have the garbage collector. So that's the... Uh, price you're paying for the comfort of having all these nice things that you have in Python. And the garbage collector is putting uh, jitter in a real-time system. So you want to design your system so that one part has no deadlines, has no restrictions, which is the MicroPython part, and then the one with the, with the deadlines would be the C part. Uh, when MicroPython came out, uh, it's, it was probably back in 2014, I was very excited that a project like this was finally feasible on uh, bare metal systems, so on those class of devices that have very low memory and, uh, well, almost medium-sized flash. Today, the, the devices are about 128, 256K, even one megabyte K of uh, one megabyte of flesh. Um, but the problem is that the main business of the MicroPython project was the Pi board. So what they did is they, they provided the whole MicroPython as an application. And their idea was to uh, allow plain users who know how to program in uh, Python do actually some embedded work. Well, this is very good if you want to control your uh, sprinkler in, in the garden or non-critical part in uh, regular life. 
even though I think even sprinkle could cause some damage. But uh, it would be nice if you can use and take all these benefits uh, in industry. So I didn't like that they put all these components together. And if you look actually in the, in the repository, it's still almost in the same state for the past two years. So it contains all the examples. It contains all the different architectures, a lot of duplicate codes in the drivers. So when you switch a platform, you never know if it's going to work because there could be a bug in the hull. Anyways, um, and I thought it was a pity. So let's uh, isolate the core, figure out how to integrate it with the rest of the, of the world. Uh, by the rest of the world, I mean uh, the real-time operating systems and your uh, tasks. That would be actually a feasible solution even for existing uh, companies because they can think of isolating their business logic out of their real-time application to Python and leave, leave the bottom. A lot of companies use free artros. It's very, very widely used. And leave the core as is, without touching it. You just isolate stuff into one extra task. That's it. So that was my idea. Uh, but the problem is, who should build this? And by building, I mean really mean the compilation. Because the components that we have here is the free RTOS. We have uh, MicroPython. We probably have tons of libraries that are that maybe internal, specific for each company and his domain, and uh, some common libraries. Like in this project, I've reused some GPS parsing library. And there are two parts missing in this puzzle. One of them uh, is something that would let you configure things. So what we did, uh, we took the same approach as Linux kernel does. I'm not saying this is the only way and it's ideal. But uh, basically, we wanted to have the same kind of configuration that's available in Linux kernel in any ecosystem that you create. So that, that doesn't mean this is fixed. If you decide on like free Artos and you put Nutix in there, you can integrate with it. If you have your own library, you can easily add configurations similar in the same way like Linux kernel does. And I have uh, purposely expanded here the MicroPython micro Python part here. Not sure if it's really visible. It's just a subset of all the features that, that Python right now has, the MicroPython right now has. Uh, but it at least tries to export these to the user. I don't know if anybody of you saw the sources of uh, regular embedded projects, and MicroPython is one of them. Uh, what they do, they usually distribute the sources and tell you, OK, here's the header. And you're supposed to change those defines, and the thing is going to behave differently. Well, this is nice. But first of all, how am I supposed to know all this? Well, maybe it's documented. And second, it's difficult and not obvious how to integrate it with the rest of your uh, code base. And we wanted, we wanted this to be independent. So we've created uh, the, descript the descriptors, which are kconfig files, as you may know from the Linux kernel. And now the main part, who will build this? And the answer is maybe obvious. Well, I'm building Python, so I want to use Python. So I took scons. Scons is uh, already a very mature project written in Python. And unlike Make, uh, it provides a very streamlined process when, when you are designing your build system and build environment. Actually, what it wants from you is to define your dependencies properly, and that's it. And scons do, does the rest. Unlike Make, uh, you probably you may have seen how Linux kernel build system looks like. Uh, it's actually very smooth because what you do is you only define a bunch of object files. Uh, it's a pity that this is at the very end, but this is a trick that actually conditionally enables some module. Uh, but if you see or if you check what's behind this, that's a mess. This is how we are supposed to use uh, a build system, but this is not how you are supposed to use make. 
uh, because what's behind this is recursive execution of the whole build system, which is very difficult to debug and very difficult to change or extend. So one, in one of the first iterations that we had, we were actually using Make for this for a couple of years. Some of our customers still have this build system based on Make. Uh, it works, but you come to a limitation. And the limitation actually came with MicroPython. And the reason was that you are uh, forced to generate code. With Python, it's really cool. You can have a Python script and, let's say, your application requires a CRC generator. So let's take a CRC implementation, give it some polynom, and this code would be able to do the CRC calculation, the redundancy check in Python. At the same time, it could generate a piece of uh, C table for the CRC calculator of the generator. And you want to build this together. And when you are uh, facing those kind of challenges when you have to generate different parts of code, uh, then you start thinking, OK, well, let's hack this into the build system. And then when the features start adding, you say, OK, I quit. Uh, I'll have a look around. If there is something better, that will let me uh, do this more efficiently and more easily. And this is where Python comes in again. And this is, what, this is the reason why I actually choose scones. I was looking at different, different build systems from uh, what's being used in Java, I forgot, uh, to CMake and others, uh, but none of them fulfilled all these requirements. And the, and the nice benefit that any piece of Python code that you actually can run, you can run it inside of the build system, simplifies the whole thing tremendously. What I'm going to show next doesn't look nicer than this, but it's more extensible. Uh, the list is pretty much the same. The problem is that's a little bit more verbose. On the other hand, whoever saw Python before recognizes this as a plain Python. Even though this doesn't run as a regular Python because this is parsed by scones and then interpreted at the right time when it's supposed to, to be run, it pretty much does the same thing like the make file before. So we have a list of modules that generate an object. Uh, this is a QString object, and this is where uh, we had to implement this in scones, because in uh, MicroPython, you are forced to scan your C source files for something called QStrings. So we just made an extension uh, saying this is not going to be a regular object file like you know uh, from Make, but uh, it would be a special object file that before uh, it's being generated, you want to have it scanned and generate the Q QStrings. Uh, at the bottom, as a similar feature, just conditionally enabled based on your selection. So this is some USSL, micro SSL Python external module. Uh, I wanted to show uh, just a snippet of the kconfig. It is nothing uh, spectacular or surprising. You would see this in, in Linux kernel. Uh, the kconfig language uh, has some limits. It is not ideal. We are still looking for, or we used to, we used to look for a better solution. But to prove that the concept would actually work, we decided to give it a try. So this, this example just shows how you define an option to control a micro SSL module, and then it's disabled by default. And that's what you saw in here. Oh, sorry, it was in external modules. Are there any questions? Uh, the URL uh, has links to the presentation. It has links to the uh, scons uh, tool that we have developed for this, because scons would not really do this natively. You have to write your own tool, which is nice. That's the standard way how you extend it. And there are a bunch of notes about uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, there is also a link for our branch of MicroPython and the demo that's actually running on the boat. I don't know how much time we have. 26. Uh, 
I have a demo prepared. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, it would be very ergonomic to view it, but let's give it a try, unless there are questions. Uh, there are a few questions from Slido. Uh, did you consider running MicroPython with uh, the garbage collector disabled? Would that be feasible? Uh, I tried at the very beginning with my experiments, because those were my initial thoughts. Uh, at the time, I think it was still version 1.6. Now we have 1.9, and this runs on 1.8. Uh, it didn't work. There was some bug that would prevent it to run uh, without the garbage collector. I was talking to the developers about this, and then I just decided, OK, garbage collector is not so bad for this application. But if I had some special application where I am not allowed to even do garbage collecting, I would consider that. Hey, thanks. And uh, does the garbage collector add so much jitter? Uh, couldn't you uh, get at least under some soft real-time uh, constraints? Uh, you would. I'm not, I'm not saying that this whole application uh, would not run on the, on the board. You would probably made it. It's not really that much critical, but I wanted to prove a concept. You cannot come to a company and saying, OK, you're going to throw away all your code and you just run everything in Python. They would be scared. You can tell it to a bank, switch your e-banking. I tried to write Python, it's taking like four years. Because you know the, the basic rule is don't mess th with things that work. So slowly. And uh, did you actually win the race? Did I what? Win the race. The oh, this one. Actually, it's a, it's a promo video from a friend of mine in Poland. Uh, I was not in this race, but he was actually sending it to me to come to there. But uh, from the results, uh, I, I am the champion for the Czech Republic, but I don't have a global impact yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I'm getting to it. But you right. see, my... Uh, my focus there is the electronics. That's why I put it there. Uh, the boats are adrenaline, but you, you, I just, I personally enjoy the hobby because of the technical background in it. So, what's the next step? Could you develop a self-driving boat to win the race? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, well, I was already thinking about a small cheat. Uh, it's not given in the rules, but what would really help is uh, have a self-leveling of the boat. It would just making the balance of the boat perfect, because most of the crashes you saw, it goes really, really quickly. Most of the crashes are due to your mishandling of the boat at a wrong time, at a wrong place. And if you had a, an assisting system like the aircrafts have, uh, that would stabilize the boat, it would be first step. Um, I don't think they would let me uh, do it self-driving, uh, but unlike cars, on the water you are somehow similar like in the air, because you never know where the boat exactly is going. It's you know, usually floating a little bit outside of this axis if it's a regular boat, slow boat. So yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, going, I'm not headed for, uh, for a self-driving boat. I was thinking of, of, a, of, a, of a drone that would actually collect our boats because with the combustion engine, they sometimes die, and you have to collect them. Uh, do you want to see the demo? It's yeah. really stupid, but it's a demo. <laughs> OK. Um, the batteries have to be plugged in right. If not, we're going to see some nice fumes here. Put them inside. So, this is my remote controller. I really raced with this. This is a servo, nothing uh, special. I just took it so that you see that it's actually doing something. So there is a radio link between this thing with the thing in the box. I'm not going to lift it because there are too many wires, but you can come after the presentation to see it. And tomorrow, there is actually a great workshop by Viarosh about MicroPythons, uh, just the pure MicroPython running on ESP8266. So uh, the board is probably booted. I have to switch my screen.
cool. Okay. I'm going to reset it again because I want to show you the boot. Okay. Um, so the system is running now. Uh, since I don't have an SD card in it, it, ha it just stopped operating in terms of the MicroPython task, and it just jumped into an interpreter, which is pretty cool. So. The point of the demonstration is to show that the whole real-time part is actually running. All the tasks are actually measuring stuff. And uh, you can interactively talk to it. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to mirror my uh, display of my cell phone on the computer. It usually dies after a few seconds. So I cannot show you how I can send the sensors uh, to my cell phone, because that's what the application is doing in the background when it's running and the SD card is in there. But I can show you how easily I can actually talk to the board. Let's, let's say that we want to get the, the exhaust gas temperature and whatever, some GPS stuff, but there's going to be no GPS here. We're covered on the roof. So we'll import the application. This is a convention that you can choose, whatever. I just decided it's going to be an app. This is a C code. There is no Python behind the app, and it's directly extending the, the, the MicroPython environment. This is the instance of the application. And the cool thing is that the REPL has a code completion. So you see what, what options we have. Let's see, I want to see the temperature. We're getting 25 degrees and 25.3. Uh, I wish I had a coffee here. But I can show you this is the exhaust probe. It's measuring something like 400. If I hold it for a little bit, we should, we should at least get some increase. Yeah, it's going to take a bit. I called it. OK. Let's try it later. <laughs> But the demo works, I think. It's pretty good for a demo, I think. Uh, let's talk to the GPS. If she tells anything, no, she won't. She has no signal. Uh, and the same thing is with the RPM sensor, which I could have demoed if I took a piece of magnet with me. So this is pretty much it. Uh, I hope you like it. It's no science. It's really only pure engineering, putting things and bricks together and playing with it. Uh, and that's why I do it. <laughs>